contribution to the debate around the immigration reform and any other issues related to undocumented immigrants uh, and those topics that are so much surrounded uh, by discussions at this point and hopefully things will move forward in the right direction and we're going to talk about what's the right direction <laughs> for each of us. Uh, so uh, we have here on our panel uh, Carlo Alban who's an actor and theater artist. <laughs> we have uh, Martin Hi. Denton who's editor-in-chief of nytheater.com and the uh, Indie Theater Now. We have Maika Espinoza, an assistant professor at Arizona State University, and Jessica Litwak, a playwright and a professor. Uh, I and Jessica, we are part of the five women writers, together with Chiori Miyagawa, uh, Mia Chung, and Andrea Tom, who co-wrote Dream Act, a play about uh, Dream Act eligible youth. Actually, uh, next Sunday at Skirball Center at NYU, we'll be having a reading with uh, Broadway actors directed by Christine Horton and a panel discussion with immigration lawyers, uh, 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 an immigration scholar, and undocumented youth. So check us out. However, today you will have a little preview of our Dream Act play. Uh, we'll have uh, Ithaca College students and NYU student, uh, CJ Lead, uh, and my Ithaca College students, uh, Gilani Pitcher and Julian Risetto, will read an excerpt from our Dream Act. So we'll get a little sense of it, and then we're going to have a Q&A with you guys. So first, let's get started. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask each of our panelists to tell us uh, how does your work or your life related to Dream Act to our play, Dream Act, or generally to the immigration issue. If you can give us a sort of five minutes introductory remarks. Thank you, Carlo. Hi, uh, good afternoon, evening. <laughs> my name is Carlo Alban, I'm, a, I'm an actor uh, primarily, and uh, my, connection to, uh, my connection to the issue of immigration is personal. I uh, emigrated to this country while, when I was seven years old with my parents and my brother. Um, we came on a tourist visa, uh, overstayed our visa, planning to stay the whole time, came on a tourist visa, overstayed our visa, and then uh, proceeded to apply for uh, documentation. And we did everything by the book as much as possible, except maybe overstaying our visa. And uh, that process took 12 years. So from the age of seven to 19, uh, I, we were, I was undocumented. and. Um, I was not like one of those kids that find out, you know, when they when they all of a sudden need to get their license. My parents told us the whole time we were aware, so, uh, uh, you know, that created a certain kind of tension, I guess, uh, for a ch for as a child and in and in our family dynamics, um, and uh, also additionally, I became an actor when I uh, was eleven. I uh, randomly auditioned for a play and was cast, and uh, it was a big moment of decision for my family because, you know, we were kind of keeping it on the lowdown, and, uh, but ultimately my parents decided that we had come here to give us children opportunities, so they decided to let me do this play, and the play turned into a career. It turned into something that I started doing. Um, when I was 14 years old, I was cast on Sesame Street, uh, as a regular on the program, and uh, I, you know, proceeded to to be on that show for five years as an undocumented immigrant, uh, not behind their backs, but they didn't know. I presented just as anybody who was trying to get a job in a restaurant would present the fake papers, a fake green card, a fake uh, social security number. I did the same thing, except it was not for a television program. Um, and I was on that show for five years. Uh, my family was finally documented when I was when I was 19. It was my sophomore year of college, and I continued in the arts. And I became a member of a theater company in New York. And they encouraged people to grow as artists and to you know to develop as writers and directors and not just actors. And so I decided to write a play about it uh, called Intringulis, which is a, a solo show that I did. Um, that I developed over seven years. The last time it was produced was in New York by Intar. 
and <laughs> I'm talking a lot. <laughs> that's that's my connection. That's my connection to this issue. Um, so it's you know it's very personal. I, I know a little bit. I try to keep up with the news. I know a little bit about what's going on with the laws and the dreamers and how that's constantly shifting. Um, but mostly what I know is just is my personal experience. Um, and I also have been working with Saviana and, and uh, Andrea and Chiori and uh, Jessica and Mia uh, with the Dream Act, and I'm going to be taking part in that reading uh, next Sunday, right? Um, so yes, that's who I am. Thank you so much, Carlo. Now, Micah, I know that you have lots of connections and your work is pretty much uh, uh, in depth in terms of uh, uh, Arizona dreamers and everything related yeah. to immigration over there. Can you give us a little insight on sure. into that? Hello. <laughs> I'm Mike Espinosa, professor of voice and acting at Arizona State University in Tempe. And I am a social justice in the classroom advocate, a cultural voice activist, a teatrista, a libro traficante, <laughs> and a third generation Sonoran. I live in Phoenix, where daily dreamers and immigrant advocates plan waves of demonstrations and other events to keep pressure on the federal government. I live in a state where a group of Republican politicians brazenly deny dreamers driver's licenses, whose sheriff target dreamer families, where ethnic studies has had to fight their way back into existence, and where teachers are fired where teachers are fired for having Mexican accents and whose racist laws and policies have emboldened other states to create copycat legislation. But I also live in a state where the sacrifices and the hard work of a group of undocumented students and their advocates are transforming the cultural, economic, and political landscape of our state and the nation. I am happy to report that the ground is shifting in Arizona. The tough stance on immigration is wearing thin the negativity and financial damage to Arizona has awakened Arizona's, Arizonans in really interesting ways. It is estimated that there was a loss of one half billion dollars in the economic activity between 2010 and 2012. Suddenly, because of our reputation and a boycott of the state, Arizona was not on the shortlist for numerous companies. 300,000 undocumented left the state. APS and SRP are electric companies. They felt that fallout. So an odd positive side effect is that Anglo leadership business and Latino leadership business have been in conversation. An example of that is Arizona Latino Leadership Research Enterprise and Arizona Blue Cross Blue Shield have been seeking solutions because immigration reform equals business. There are now more Latinos in leadership positions and more Latinos are registered to vote than ever before. Of the 70,000 new voters in Maricopa County, 70% of those were Latinos. The artist community has partnered with dreamers, finding solutions, embracing the complexity, giving body and voice to change. For example, Arizona playwright and journalist James Garcia, aptly named Dream Act, follows a young girl's plight as she studies to become a doctor at ASU, pays for her education, and lives in the library. Her parents, fearful for their freedom, have returned to Mexico, and she is homeless, alone, and struggling to work and stay invisible. Visual art has been created, songs have been written, films have been made, and much of this response has been played out on the steps of our capital. We've raised our voices in support of the dreamers and protested through song, poetry, theater, dance, and music. The national artistic community has come to support Arizona artists and dreamers. Last year, No Passport hosted its conference on the campus of Arizona State, and we dialogued about this very issue. And now in 2014, some of you may know this, but I'm gonna go ahead and announce it again, that ATHA, the Association Theater and Higher Education, will be having their conference in Scottsdale, and they have decided to name that conference DreamAx. Yay! <laughs> Latino politics is looking better. With the help of Citizens for a Better Arizona, the people of Maricopa County successfully recalled Russell Pierce. Now Pierce, whose law enforcement mentality, affiliations with racist organizations, and he was the mastermind behind SB 1070, had to go. 
And now the citizens of Maricopa County are actively seeking to recall Sheriff Joe Arpaio. We need 350,000 some signatures, um, but we are on target. Um, there are hundreds of people every day getting those signatures. In Tucson, even the ethnic studies fight created some interesting shifts in favor of Latinos. Three new Latino school board members were elected and a new, more vibrant program has been imagined and required by the federal government. Dreamers fit into all of this because their influence politically embodies and symbolizes a sophisticated glass, grass roots, ooh, that's a hard one, grass root effort to organize and embody the best of our democracy. Dreamers are the best of our democracy. They are not the ACLU. They are not constitutional attorneys. They are a youth-led organization that has the spirit of every great civil rights movement, and they are undocumented and unafraid. These dreamers, they dream big. While other students there are worrying their age, are worrying about proms and dating, they are fighting not only for a path to full citizenship for themselves, but also for each of the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the nation. And I was thinking about today and how it, all this fit into today. And I think that maybe their stories, their struggles, their dreams are the new great American play. <laughs> they challenge hierarchies every day. I've been going to their meetings, I've been protesting alongside of them, and they inspire me and plays should be written about them. Thank you so much, Micah. Uh, Martin, you know a lot about indie plays. <laughs> Give us a little insight into that and how your work relates uh, to immigration and playwrights writing about immigration. Well, <coughs> I'm Martin Denton. Is this working? Can you hear me? Am I good? Because I'm not. Can you move it a little closer? Move it a little closer. How are we now? OK. And you can tell that I am totally lacking poise and experience with microphones. But uh, that's because I spend my days in the audience uh, reviewing theater most of the time, so I don't have to do this type of stuff. Um, my company is the New York Theater Experience, which is a nonprofit based here in New York City um, that has a mission of trying to promote uh, the theater uh, and trying to level the playing field. Uh, that's kind of our, our um, mantra, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and it means a lot of things. It, it usually means um, that we're talking about comparing um, well-funded commercial theater or large nonprofit theater and, and trying to um, call attention to the rest, the much larger and more vibrant part of the theater community um, who don't get the attention that that, 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 that sector gets. Um, but in this context, it also has, talks about something that's really important to me, which is the fact that we try very hard to be very inclusive and, um, and uh, diverse in covering uh, theater that reflects cultures and issues that are different from my own experience and the experience of, of you know, for want of a better word and just to generalize, if will, if will permit me, the mainstream. Um, I do not have an immigration story myself. I'm a third generation American. I'm very comfortable. I don't have to worry about looking over my shoulder, thank, thankfully. But the thing that has been great about working in the theater uh, in the way that I do is that I have been able to meet and learn so much about experiences that I never dreamed I never thought about. I'm so comfortable in my in my environment. And when Chiori and Saviana and the other ladies brought Dream Acts to my attention, it was really a wake-up call for me because I did not have really much knowledge. I guess I had some vague awareness that there was some legislation about this topic, but you know, it didn't really matter to me. And the great thing about great theater, great art is that it makes things matter to you. It calls, call, opens your eyes, calls your attention to new work, uh, new issues that you didn't know about, and that's what Dream Acts did for me. And what I have hoped to be able to do through the various projects that, that I uh, operate is to help Dream Acts then call, do the same wake, wake up for others who aren't aware. We have two main programs at New York Theater, New York Theater Experience. One of them is nytheater.com, which is a website that's been around since 1996, which is uh, mostly a review and listings website. We try to review as much theater as we can here in New York every year. I think we've probably reviewed more shows over the last 16 years than any other media outlet. 
And um, that's how I've come to meet so many of these amazing immigrant authors. That's how I met Saviana. Saviana, I love my meeting story with Saviana. If you don't mind, I'm going to tell it. Um, every year since 2002, we have um, reviewed every show in the New York International Fringe Festival at nytheater.com. We're the only place that does that. It's about 200 shows to review in two weeks. And the only way we can do that is to get lots of hands on deck. And the first year that we started it, we made the announcement actually at the Fringe NYC town meeting, which is a uh, some a place where the participants gather to uh, prepare and get information about the upcoming festival. And so in 2002, I made the announcement that nytheater.com was going to attempt this for the first time and review every show and invited people who were interested to join us. And then outside the theater after the meeting, here comes this lady who I'd never laid eyes on before, um, who said, I'm Saviana, I have a show in the festival, and uh, I'm from Romania, I've only been in the country about a year, and I would love to be part of this. And I admired so much that her desire to immerse herself in the New York theater community in this wonderful participatory way. And um, so without knowing anything else about her, I said, fine, you're hired. And um, Saviana has been actually been part of our, our big family and of, of, of reviewers and, and writers ever since. And I've been so privileged to get to know her and to see her work uh, progress as she has really advanced in this country and, and um, I mean she was always a great playwright and, but she has is thankfully becoming a little better known. I'm proud that I'm the, f we were the first to publish her. We published her short play Arlock Blues in our anthology Plays and Playwrights 2006 and uh, we also published Saviana and Carrie Dodd and um, I don't know who else is in the room. That may, if, I, if I don't recognize you or see you, I f please forgive me, but many, about 200 other playwrights um, on our new website which is IndieTheaterNow.com which was launched last August, and which is a place where we're actually publishing scripts online for basically for academics and students and um, actors and people who are interested in just keeping track of uh, the course of theater. And uh, again, trying to provide a place, a home, for work that would not be seen elsewhere. And um, that's, that's always been the, the main impetus for everything that we try to do at, uh, in the New York Theater Experience, which is to, to try to call attention to this worthy work um, that people that's falling under the radar. And um, so I've been excited that I have gotten to work with and, and, and meet and help hopefully start to call attention to and bring focus to the work of many folks. Uh, Dream Axe is one of the plays we published in Indie Theater Now. It's available there now. I also uh, was happy to see the a very short run that they did last year at here, and I wrote something about that for Indie Theater Now. And I've really been, just been trying to be as supportive as I can of not just the immigrant cause that's documented in the play, but sort of the larger cause of, of theater being able to bring positive social change, uh, because I really firmly believe that it can. And I probably talked way longer than five minutes. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you so much, Martin. Yeah, you have helped so many theater artists and playwrights uh, to really make a little impact here in New York City. Uh, Jessica, um, our project, Dream Act, uh, conceived by Chiori Miyagawa, uh, who asked us, uh, the other four playwrights, to co-write uh, uh, this great, um, you know, uh, play that I think uh, tackles important issues. So we started to do research. We did uh, so much together. Can you talk a bit about our project, uh, Dream Act, and of course, generally about your work connected to immigration and uh, the Dream Act? Thank you. Thank you, Saviana. You're so good at this. <laughs> I've been at a couple of things that she's uh, emceed, and it's really exciting. My daughter designed that. So, just thought I'd say. Um, my, my, you know, my deep uh, connection to this project uh, is, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about, about, um, how it came to be, but first I'll just tell you my orientation. Not like sexually, just, <laughs> just you know, professionally. I, um, I am a, a, a core member of Theater Without Borders and on their steering committee, I work with an organization called Free Dimensional. Um, this year we have, uh, one of our big projects was to connect those two. So if you go to the Theater Without Borders website, there's a button it took us about five months to get on there that you can push and it's for artists in distress. It's for people who, 
who are in trouble. And that goes directly to Roberto Verrera and myself, and it's uh, an intake form which, uh, at where we field a lot of the theater artists, it's, it's for theater artists, uh, because there are other organizations like Free Muse that work with musicians, and it's for theater artists in distress all over the world. And we are right now uh, a, a dealing with an actress who escaped from Afghanistan, and is we've got her in Delhi, but we're trying to make sure she has enough money for rent, that kind of thing. Um, since all we have is the Actors Fund, <laughs> there isn't a lot for theater artists. As we heard earlier, um, when we are come together as a community to to take care of Arini Fornes, who should have be a millionaire, and and instead it's a few people from the theater community that are that are making sure her last her last few days are okay. So this is something I'm very involved with. Uh, I also work for an organization called Acting Together on the World Stage, and teach I teach a lot about peace building and performance and theater and social change. I'm a playwright and a performer. And um, about two and a half years ago, um, Chiori and I were doing a um, some workshop at the Lark, and I, uh, I decided I was gonna write the entire Spanish Civil War in, in five days, but I wanted to finish the entire thing in five days. And I think she just thought I was the weirdest person she'd ever met, so she invited me to dinner with Kristen, and we had dinner with two teachers two amazing young women who teach uh, in Queens and, and Brooklyn, um, one of whom had, I think, it, in her class of 66 students in 11th grade, only six were citizens. Only six of 66 had any sort of documentation. And so she worked, she told us stories over dinner about some of the things this youth, these youth were going through and, um, you know, one guy was this very, very handsome Ecuadorian young man who was about to get a job, and then they asked for his papers, and he said, I don't have any, and they said, funny, you don't look undocumented, <laughs> which um, actually became a line in the play, I think, uh, over time. So we, so we, this became a conversation with teachers and a need. It was a vision that Chiori had, and, and eventually the five playwrights from five different ethnicities came together, and we worked. One of the things that was my job to do originally was to, to um, get workshops together with undocumented youth and match playwrights up with youth. I think you, you had to go to a coffee shop and meet your your, your two <laughs> Latinas, and we and we 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 actually uh, the way the way it developed was pretty cool. We um, there were five women and Kristen, so six women, um, and we but each of the five playwrights pit, we divided up the the, the um, aspects of the Dream Act into five different aspects: the legal aspect, the language aspect, the um, daily, life. daily life. I got detention and deportation, um, we, um, and we divided them up. So each of us got one, and then we each got an ethnicity. So, um, and not the ethnicity that we were. So, so Sabiana got the Middle Eastern one. Um, Andrea was, was Eastern European. Um, Mia, Mia was, wrote about her own ethnicity when she wrote about Korean and uh, Chiori wrote about African, an African woman, an African um, uh, undocumented youth, and I wrote about a Mexican youth. And then, but you're not supposed to know that really because that's, <laughs> that was just how it began. And then we, sp and then we put it together. So hopefully if you come back on um, the 10th, you, you'll see a piece where you won't know who wrote what. And so part of what this collaboration was is about five playwrights and it working with five stories and five different ethnicities and five different, uh, and the, the stories that we tell are not stories of specific youth. We, we worked with the youth to get, to get ideas, but we didn't tell their stories. These are completely fictional stories that we, that we fabricated based on research. So, so hopefully it's a piece that you won't, you won't see who wrote what. It's just an interesting process that it took us to get there, but it's hopefully quite seamless in the way Kristen has worked with it. 
is, um, is beautiful. And um, for me, I'm leaving uh, in a few hours to go to Lebanon to work on a, a play. Um, I was about to say a theater project. That's the way my uncle says it, theater. I'm gonna come see your theater. And I'm going to work with Iraqis. I went to Basra, Iraq and worked with, and, and did theater and taught. And, cr and I'm working on a play, collaborating with a, a male Iraqi, younger than me, guy. And he's a playwright, and I'm a playwright, and we're writing together, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And we're, and we're going to Lebanon, because right now it's not safe in, to go to Iraq. So we're meeting in, in Beirut, which apparently is very safe. <laughs> and, um, but it is the, the, the difficulty of communication is the work of my life now, of, of theater as a tool for peace building and social change really in action and putting myself kind of on the front lines of that in, in, in daily life. As, and, and I just want to end with this one thing that uh, one of our great playwrights, uh, Katrin Fio, who I think was here earlier, but is not here now. But she said, we were talking and she said, you know, I, I wonder, or maybe it was Heather Raffo who said this to me. I've been having a lot of discussions about this this week, so forgive me, I might be misquoting the wrong female playwright. But she said, it is, um, it's sometimes you have to choose between true collaboration and, and a great play. You know, you really have to make a choice. Are you gonna go in there to make cultural exchange? In that case, let go of the result and just allow it, you know, the microphone to fall and see what comes. And really, there is no, no agenda. If you go in there, and I, of course, wrote 60 pages of what I feel is, you know, and then fell in love with it and now may have to throw it away when I get to Beirut. So, you know, do you have to give that up? Do you have to give up art for message? Do you have to give up art for true collaboration? And hopefully um, the example of working with five women together, we did not have to give up art for message or art for collaboration. We worked quite, you know, and, and I don't know if that's because, you know, we're chicks, <laughs> but it's definitely because we, we had to work, we had to work hard at it and Kristen sort of guided us there. But I'm telling you, it's it is the language, and um, and cultural difference is is a challenge, and uh, we're in the trenches. Give your microphone. Yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, thank you, Jessica. I think you summed up so beautifully the way we worked. Um, so as for me, my personal story, of course, connected to immigration is that I came here from Romania in 2001 after, of course, living in during the totalitarian regime of dictator Ceausescu. And then uh, I worked as a journalist throughout the transition towards whatever democracy <laughs> we got. And then uh, since I moved to New York City and, uh, of course, to the US, uh, all my plays are about immigration, maybe because this is what I was experiencing. So all my work is about living in between, negotiating between uh, the old values and the new values. Uh, I'm exploring non-stop the way in which uh, uh, American dream can turn into an American nightmare sometimes. So yeah, this is what I think I've been doing through my plays, Aliens with Extraordinary Skills, which actually is the title of a visa that I was on, and they are published by No Passport um, as well. So now let's try to talk um, uh, briefly about what is uh, the role of theater in fostering social change. Can we really foster social change? What do you guys think? Can we really make an impact? Can we really push uh, social change through our work? Carlo? Um, <laughs> I, I, I believe that we can. Uh, you know, when I, when I first decided to write the play that I wrote, I, there wasn't much talk of this. It wasn't in the news. Nobody was writing about it that I knew. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the main reasons why I decided to do it. And now there's all this, uh, and now there's all this activity because people have started speaking up. Uh, which I think is very important, and I think that a large, a large number, a, a large part of that activity has come from the arts and has come from theater, and has because we have, we are endowed with the power to speak. We give people a voice that they don't normally have, 
Um, and in this case, specifically uh, people who tend to be voiceless. Uh, so yes, I think absolutely the more that we get the information out there and the more that we speak, uh, the more people will understand and the more that communication will be fostered and the, I believe the more change will happen. Change is happening, it's been happening, um, and I think it will continue to. Uh, uh, Micah, do you think? Um, you can. Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways. Um, an outlet is really important. You see, oh, I turned this thing off. Um, an outlet for, um, an outlet for, um, for a community to feel, for to be able to express themselves, it's absolutely huge. Um, and and then when I said literally, we've been performing on the Capitol. We've been putting on plays right there, in front of the Capitol. <laughs> and um, so I think that was pretty powerful. That that got the news out there. And I think the relationship between the artists and the shows and and as an act of protest, these plays were happening, and the journalists were there. And um, that that triangle between the journalists and the the artists, the performers, and the activists became very very important in this movement in Arizona. I just want to say to uh, what Carlo, one of the things that's really powerful about your play is a kind of outing of the audience that they were watching that kid on Sesame Street all those years. I mean, I remember watching your show and thinking how powerful that is to go. You were watching one of those undocumented youth like every week thinking he was just a you know normal kid and look right. he was one of them yeah there's a yeah. there's a section in the play where I uh, talk about being in the Macy's Day parade I was you yeah. know Sesame Street had a float and I was in the parade and there's literally millions of people lining the streets of New York City yeah. waving at me like I'm their neighbor you know because they know me me us you know the show um, and th the fact is that that <laughs> <laughs> That's happening all over the country. Yeah. You know, I knew, I grew up knowing that there were a lot of, so many people like me, but I didn't know who they were because nobody was speaking up. And also because I was fortunate enough to be on the show, aside from the fear that I felt, uh, there was a great sense of responsibility. And, you know, I mean, I knew that if, <laughs> that media and the arts are, uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of power there. And there's a lot of, possibility and if you are in the position in in which I found myself and in, in which we all are I think it is it's a responsibility thank you Carlo and yes and for, I for instance I created an alliance called the New York uh, uh, immigrant artists and scholars and we have an annual event at the New Rican Poets Cafe called New York with an accent where you know various artists and scholars showcase their work for five to seven minutes. And actually it's gonna be this uh, year on uh, March 13, uh, from six to nine. Um, and we of, of course accept all kind of uh, artists, emerging artists, newcomers, established artists. So it's really important to develop this kind of sense of uh, community. I don't know if we're gonna really make social change, but at least we're gonna take it uh, one step at a time. We're gonna make a step forward, I think. I mean, I, I believe it. I, I, I did the, that. I performed in that last year, even as a, you know, Jew. Uh, you know, I mean, really, seriously, there was a, I do a lot of work with about Emma Goldman and my grandparents were, were immigrants had raised me. And at that point it was, you know, it's something that is not on the radar of immigration, but I grew up with the sense of being an immigrant. And now I, I really am looking at the privilege of being a Westerner and spending so much of my time this year in Iraq and West Bengal and, and Lebanon and Palestine, looking at what, what are we, you know, what is, what is social change through the arts? What are we accomplishing? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to open people's eyes? The, we had this, we taught this workshop, David Diamond and I at La Mama last week and we're traveling around the country teaching of like, how, how do you do this? Do, do, can you do social justice in theater? Can you do peace building and performance? And we asked the, the, the participants to come up with one crazy idea, crazy idea for social justice. And I think the crazy idea that Chiori had is let's get the DREAM Act passed with a play. Let's actually pass this legislation with a piece of theater. I think this is a good plug for having a, a little excerpt of Dream Act's Red, uh, 
Uh, so we have our student actors uh, from Ithaca College, the BFA students, uh, Gilani Pitcher and Julian Risetto, take your places. And <laughs> from uh, NYU, uh, CJ Lead. So they will read the uh, 15, no, 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 they are fine. So they will read the, a little excerpt from DreamHack so you guys understand what we are talking about. <laughs> First day I've been in this place. He's from my neighborhood, you know what I mean? Ramon's been in detention even longer than me, but they haven't moved him around as much. So he's just been in here a really long time. I don't think my mind even knows where I am anymore. It's just me and him, and I haven't seen or heard from Ramon in three or four days now, maybe five. Hey, I don't need your personal radio show going on and on. I need you to be invisible and silent. I am already invisible. You can't see my voice. See your voice? Are you a poet? No, you people make too much noise all the damn time. What you people and documented kids or Latinos? Huh? What are you? Christmas in general. Guys? Come on, silence, kid. Sure, that's cool. I ain't nothing to look at anyway. Silent and invisible. Yo, blank. Like a blank sheet of paper. Okay, then. You know what Ramon says? Uh, here we go. Ramon says, after all this time with no paper, we are finally documented with prison print, man. I got me a correctional jacket fat, it's this wall. Ramon calls it bad paper. And we got it because we never had the good paper to begin with, called the passport, called the visa, called the birth certificate, called certification of citizenship, called the social security card, called the green card, card that gets me in that door to a real nine to five legal job. Too much Keep quiet, Daniel, warning you, son. Follow orders or you'll end up in the hole. I've been following orders my whole 18 years, man. I do what my father told me. I did what my teacher told me, what my priest told me. I only defied one order. I got on that bus. My mother said, Danny, don't. Stay out of the radar like a good boy. Ever since I knew I were illegal, I've been sneaking around like a Siamese cat. No one walks more careful than me. It was the senior class trip to Atlantic City. Of course I didn't have no driver's license. I could have asked for a ride, like my mother said, but I wanted to impress my girl, Manuela. I was Batman, man. I was invincible, dude. I ain't afraid of no ice. What a dumbass. Now I probably won't ever see her again. I'll be as invisible to her as I am to you. And invisible is pretty close to being dead. Yo, you listening? Guard, where is Ramon? Hey, any Middle Eastern dreamers on this forum? Most dreamers are Latinos, man. I know, an Australian guy. Double GTF, if I had Australia as my plan A, I wouldn't need a plan B <laughs> or D. <laughs> any students? Sure thing, man, we're all in the same boat. How do you get to college? You got papers, New Jersey? To qualify for tuition assistance at school, I have to show them proof of residence. You know, driver's license or utility bill with my name on it. No driver's license, so I have to get creative and invent some legal algorithms. That's arguments. I'm a reliable math nerd, <laughs> smiley face. So I called the utility company. They asked me for my social security number, and I begged the young lady in my sweetest voice possible, asked her if she could just add my name on the bill right now, and I call her back to give her my social security number because I don't remember it. That beautiful lady said, okay. I never called back. Holy fuck, dude, nice work. Back to prison. How you doing over there, Daniel? You know how many ways you want to kill yourself? Plenty. Stuffing wet towels under the door after you fill a bucket with ammonia from the beach. Making air embolism in your neck with a needle. Slice your wrists across with a stick and then run them under hot water so the blood can't clot. Tie weights to your ankles and just jump off the George Washington Bridge into that hot All right, that's enough of that. That's right, you've got a lot of choices. And then here, all you can really do is just hang yourself. You've got window bars, bed sheets, shoelaces, socks, belts, underwear. 
You can stand up on a chair, tie anything around an overhead pipe, fix a knot around your neck, and take away the stool. If you don't got a stool or a pipe, you can just tie it into the radiator pipe and just twist your body to cut off the circulation. Gravity's all you need, and you can just hang yourself sitting on the floor. Just lean your neck against something to block your cardioid arteries. One guy I heard about tied the end of his pant legs together. He stuck his head in there and just rolled back over, over, twisting it tighter and tighter until he just blacked out and died. Usually takes about four to five minutes. I set you up with a social worker for tomorrow morning. How could you have let him kill himself? Why weren't you watching, making sure he sleeps with an extra thick blanket that can't be torn into strips? Give him a paper gown, check on him every 15 minutes. Just mix up the schedule so he doesn't know you're coming. You should have gotten a sitter who stayed in arm's reach. God should be trained for this shit. Or did he just throw it away? Easier to let him die, right? Saves the government more money. Saves the fucking death. If someone is bent on killing themselves, Daniel, you can't stop them without a straight jacket and padded walls. All right, those are just luxuries we do not have here. Ramon was my friend. Ramon taught me shit. He watched out for me. He was from Guatemala. He was the third of five sons. His mother had a crippled hand from working all her life in the fields. His grandfather was a union organizer for Cesar Chavez. He grew up here like me. He had a woman who was pregnant with the son. He was going to start a business. And why did he off himself? Because when you are an illegal, you got no papers. When you got no papers, you got no job. When you got no job, you got no self-respect, no rights, and no country. You got nothing. And sometimes you wake up, it's just too dark to see the things that kept you alive yesterday. There's no reason to keep fighting. Especially when you're in solitary confinement in a six by six hole with only a radiator pipe and shirt so old it almost tears itself. It doesn't seem like giving up. It seems like the only brave thing left to do. Okay, guys, I need you and your gods and the universe and the golden ratio and the supreme scientists and the 1001 virgins and whatever else has superpower over mortals out there. Here's a crazy choice I'm about to make. I'm taking this girl, Jess, to a party and I have to drive her home after that. It's our first date. Don't do it, dude. No girl is worth that kind of risk. I'm telling you. Avoid driving nice. Actually, just don't drive doll if you're undocumented. South Cal here, I think there are times when checkpoints are random, but usually it's on holidays. Cinco de Mayo was the last time they had a checkpoint on here. On those nights, just make sure to take back roads, because usually they'll set up a checkpoint on busier streets. I avoid taking certain exits off the freeway since I know they have traps at the bottom. The best advice is don't be out at all. <laughs> Wish me luck. You're one and only Middle Eastern dreamer on this forum. Dude, it's the 9-11 weekend. It's going to be full of cops and checkpoints out there. Don't do it. Whitey pulls over his car and turns off the engine. Shoot. Shoot, 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 shoot. What the fuck? Uh, sorry. There's a checkpoint or something. <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? Crazy fun. What? <laughs> the party. Yeah, it was great. What's the matter? You're like pale like a ghost. <laughs> Stony Stone? Did you smoke when I was asleep? I feel thin. Reading water. Didn't smoke anything. Go back to sleep, Jess. Ooh, go back to sleep. Mr. Water tells me to go back to sleep. <laughs> or shall I call you Woody? Like that brunette, your stalker. What was her name? Michelle. She kept calling you Woody and you didn't correct her. Woody, Waddy, Ted, just a name. You got a crush on Michelle. How can you say that? I was there with you the whole time. I didn't pay attention to anyone else. But she did. Pay attention to you, mister. Michelle. Stop it, Jess. What? Woody. Oh, pardon me. Woody. Woody Allen or Woody Woodpecker? <laughs> Woody for breakfast. Jess, please be normal. That cop is going to come to
so and so. say that you know me from school, and, and we're both from college, and we were at a student's party. <laughs> A little upset, <laughs> sir. <laughs> we, we got into an argument. Yeah. yeah. Upset my ass. She's drunk. <laughs> you seem decent guy. You didn't drink, did you? No, no, sir. No, I, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, I'm a math student. And alcohol is not good for my brain. I'm uh, I, I, I can show you my student ID and if you want. Sure. All right, all right, Venus. Come on. Go. 
season's over. My wife left me a year ago. But chicken sounds about right. <laughs> KFC, extra crispy and cold and crispy. Ah, oh, you like the extra crispy. I dream about that. <laughs> All right, dude. That's what I'll have. You'll be eating it. I'll be eating it. It's good to dream, son. Peter and CJ Lee, thank you guys for contributing to this. Uh, before opening the discussion uh, to, to your questions, I'd like to ask actually, does anyone here and everyone know what DREAM Act is? Okay, so it is uh, legislation that hasn't passed yet, but uh, people are trying to, to push it that would make uh, 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 youth uh, that are undocumented and they were brought by their parents before the age 16 to get a path towards citizenship if they are under 30. That would be the, in, in a nutshell. But let's, let's get to your questions so we can get the debate uh, uh, going. There aren't any questions. I'll, I'll go yeah. ahead and um, start to with yeah. the questions from the panelists. Well, then, yeah, I, I um, the dreamers wanted me to let everybody know that the 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 definition of dreamer needs to be expanded, and they're they're actively doing that because it families are being separated. One of the things that Sheriff Joe Arpaio is doing is um, targeting dreamer families. So um, actually, August fifteenth, uh, two thousand twelve, uh, a deferred um, a deferred act action program was sort of put into place, so they're a, a lot less afraid that you know there is something going to happen for them. People are applying; they can apply. If you want to apply for um, the development um, relief, you can. Um, as of August 15th, but now he's going after their families and separating them, and and that's so the definition of dreamer has to be expanded. And uh, something that I also wanted to bring up about papers, um, so let's say I have a 16-year-old and we're undocumented and you have a 16-year-old and both those kids have fake IDs and they go into a bar um, or something and they all get caught, right? Um, your kid gets a misdemeanor, um, my kid gets a felony and now can never become a citizen. And so um, he's, they're going after dreamers and um, prosecuting them for uh, things that would normally be petty misdemeanors and getting them upping the charges to felonies. Um, so that's something that's going on. Thank you. Yes, as we could see also from the play that is uh, based on uh, interviews but fictionalized, uh, the daily life, the things that happen in the daily life and for, you know, for American citizens uh, seem normal. They are taken for granted. They can be huge risks for uh, the dreamers. Any other questions from the panelists for the other panelists? Gosh, let me think. Um, Is 
it's it's endless. I mean, I know kids who are now 29 who were marching for the Dream Act in, you know, 2000, and um, you know, had just graduated high school. So they're gonna they're gonna age out um, pretty soon. Uh, you know, I don't know where it stands, but I know that their part of it was if you did two years of military service and two years of or if you were in college, you had to be a college student in good standing. But I did hear a lot of Republicans say that the, they were pushing the two years of military service, which means that if you don't die, you get to be, you know, to apply for a green card um, and eventually a path to citizenship. Because I think that's important that people know that it's not here, you're automatically a citizen. It's really just a path to citizenship. It could take a 28 year old another 10 years. Together. And there is actually a deferred action program that sort of postpones deportation. Yeah, the <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the one that's in place right now. Although people say that the, the uh, bipartisan agreement might be reached towards the passing the Dream Act, being you know the only piece of <laughs> the immigration reform where I hear Republicans and Democrats sort of sort of agree. They don't know yet. Yeah. They don't know yet. And it, everything depends also on what state you're in. There are 12 yeah, states so. that have, um, I, I pulled them up, Texas, California, Illinois, Utah, Nebraska, Kansas, New Mexico, New, New York, Washington, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, and Maryland, uh, Maryland has their own DREAM Act, have approved so that um, DREAMers can get in-state tuition because one of the things is not only two years of service but maybe, uh, getting your higher um, degree, being able to get your um, higher education degree. Get it. Yeah. And also there are certain colleges that are blind and others that aren't to documentation. And it really, it's really important to look at that, you know, to look at which colleges are still paying attention to documentation and which ones are, uh, are letting it go. One of the w young women that we met with in the creation of this play had just been accepted to Princeton and she had absolutely no documentation, and the question was really whether she was going to be able to go or not. Um, I think Vassar just made a, a statement that they're now document blind, um, but it, it really goes, it's not only state by state, but it's college by college. It's in terms of the actual admission or in terms yeah. of the financial support that they get? B both. I mean, oh. it, it, it depends. In-state tuition, when you're talking about a private college, is a, is a different sure, story. Yeah. But um, but even the admissions process. Uh, I mean, I I don't know how it would be if somebody had a lot of money and was going to pay full out and never go through. You know, it if they were, well, it's not ask questions. But yeah. in in every case, it's college by college when when there's any financial aid involved, mm -hmm. even in the admissions process. Hi. Um, so over the past, what feels like since our last election cycle started, I feel like I've noticed a lot of um, vocabulary I haven't heard before, like self-deportation, like the GOP's Hispanic problem, like all this language that feels really violent and weird. <laughs> and, um, and then there's this like the DREAM Act, which is, um, I don't know, I guess what I'm asking is, as, as writers and artists, um, actors, critics, activists, how you relate or interrogate or embrace the word dream, dreamers, how that intersects with your identity or not. That's a great question. Can we all try to answer that, Carla? Uh, can you, sorry, can you ask the question again? I, I'm just asking kind of about your relationship to the word dreamer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, is that clear? I don't know how to answer that. Uh, my, my relationship to the movement and to these kids is that, is that that would have been me. You know, I, I would have been in their exact same shoes if, if there had been this much activity around it at the time. Um, I think that I think that the Dream Act. Who who started it? Was it Ted Kennedy? 
who started the DREAM Act? Who wrote who, the legislation? Who, who made the phrase? Yeah. Yeah, well, who wrote yeah. the legislation and who started this movement? Right, it started um, in 2000, it was 2001, and the acronym is actually Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors. So I think they took a really bad, like, alien minors and, and, and t turned it around. I mean, that that's to me the, the interesting thing is that they put hope in it. Uh, they took this alien, I'm an alien, and then made something great out of it. Yeah. Now it would be nice to have someone signing the alien minor <laughs> syntax. It, the, the language is wonderful. It's such a great point because there is in Danny's story that he's called a removable alien. So he's removable, that's an actual phrase, removable alien, self-deportation. So dream act, and it's funny because we struggled with what to call the play and I think Savion is the, why not dream acts? You know, that it's so simple to, to not be fancy about it, to really get to it, it's just so simple. And to, to actually hear the dreamers talk of themselves as dreamers, um, the, the you know the the young man who who went on, who got on the bus on the Greyhound bus because Greyhound ma made a, an agreement with ICE to be able to go onto any bus and look at, and ask for papers of any passenger and then haul them straight off and this young man that we met with had that had happened to him I spoke to him and he said I knew I was a dreamer and the other dreamers told me don't answer questions but I was in there and they kept saying to me. Uh, in the detention center, if you give, if you admit that you're that you have no papers, we'll let you go home to your family. But he watched all the people admitting it going straight to deportation. So he kept his mouth shut, and he said it's because the other dreamers had told me not to do that. And to hear them self-identify, in comparison to the, all the words and the phrases they're identified with, like removable alien, it's uh, to me it's a very simple maybe naive, but beautiful word. Yes, and actually I like a lot, I think that those lines actually that you wrote, I shouldn't disclose that, uh, that uh, you'll be eating it, I'll be dreaming it. Somehow they sum up <laughs> the essence of our play. I always loved those lines. Um, any other questions? This have anything to do with the phrase of Martin Luther King saying, "I have a dream." Actually, that's an amazing question. Like, let's relate the dream that Martin Luther King had to this uh, uh, dream issue and the dreamers now. Let's try to make that connection. <laughs> Martin, maybe you can start to respond <laughs> a little. Well, I, I have no idea if if if, if that's if there's a connection. Or not, you know, if there's an intentional connection. Um, I actually disagree with everyone else, I think, on the panel. Um, I think that dream is, calling it the dream act is is another cynical act on the part of the government to dress something up that has an ugly name, um, that has trying to correct an ugly thing and make it sound really lovely and charming. Now, I think it's great how it has evolved and these people have decided to become, call themselves dreamers, but I think the source of it feels very cynical and, and sort of not very nice to me. Um, so it's that, since that's how I feel, I, wouldn't relate that terminology to what Dr. King said at all, although certainly the spirit of the legislation and the spirit of the art that has been inspired by it um, would feel like it had a lot to do with what Dr. King had to say. Uh, Carlo? Yeah, I, uh, speaking to what Martin just said, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily disagree. I think that, um, you know, there's the phrase, the American dream, which, which we all, know very much and I think that that's probably partly what the language is referring to and the fact is that what a lot of people miss is that a lot of these kids grow up as Americans but they're completely disenfranchised from that dream um, and so it is it, it is very much something that they're striving the dream that they're striving for that they're disenfranchised from and which the passing of this legislation would allow them to um, to achieve in some sense without so much without so much rigmarole can I can I I want to I want to I want to add something to what I said because I always had a chance to think actually I think that it relates much more to Dr. King than I originally thought 
And, and the reason I think that is because, and, and it has to do not with the act or with the legislation or the dry parts of this, but with the art. The thing that drove, the thing that Dr. King was fighting against and the thing that I guess is in the uh, mindset of those who do not want the DREAM Act passed is all bait rooted in, in fear, which is rooted in um, a lack of understanding, a fear of other cultures, a fear of people who are different, a fear of, of having something taken away from you by people you seem different from you. Um, and the great power of art and the great power of theater is to expose that fear as fallacious. Because when you, when you, you know, I may have been, um, had all kinds of abstract opinions about Eastern Europeans, and then I met Saviana, the first live Eastern European I'd really gotten to know well. <laughs> and um, whatever pre preconceptions I may have held, and I don't even know what they were at this point, um, were changed by the real thing. And that goes with, with spending time with any group. And I think the power of theater in particular is that unlike other performance media, you're live with the folks, you're there in the room with them. It makes, it's a scarier experience. People, you know, I think worry about going sometimes because you're, you have, you're, you're as an audience, you're much more exposed than you are when you see a film, for example, because the actors can see you and you can see them. And, but, but I think that exchange is so important and that's the way that something, you know, that, that the attitudes behind the, 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 the attitudes behind what the DREAM Act is trying to, that's a terrible sentence, I'll go home and rewrite it later. Um, the attitudes that the DREAM Act is trying to erase um, can only be erased through a meeting and, and getting experience with, with other people and the theater is maybe the best way artistically to do that. I, I also think it's important to remember that this, at least for now, although you bring up a good point, they're growing up. This is a movement of, of youth. These are young people. This, this act affects the young. And one of the reasons I said my daughter, you know, designed the original poster is because it, it, this means something to her. Her partner is a transgender Mexican uh, young person who actually played Danny in, when we, we did it, well, they did it, I wasn't even around uh, for, we were asked to participate in an Occupy, Wall Street uh, for youth. It was all young people doing one part of Occupy Wall Street theater in the, in the grass sometime last fall. And these kids, the college kids, uh, uh, Ari, um, my daughter's partner who's undocumented and transgender and cut off from his family, and a group of actors went down and they just did it in the grass and all the other kids who were who were also dreamers were there relating to this on a level. I mean, one of the things that we talk about, there's a cultural difference between, between you and me and you and me and you and you and me, and there's a gender difference definitely between you and me. Um, I mean, <laughs> maybe, but I don't know. But, um, but, but we aren't addressing, and I don't, I don't know if we begin to address people who are actually under 25 in this room, there is a difference between the way somebody older thinks and the way somebody younger thinks about the word dream and about the action that dream has versus the people who are putting that name on an ugly thing. I think what I'm, what I'm responding to is the youth that we worked with, the youth we tried to represent, we tried to write these young voices and the youth that have responded to the piece and the youth that tend to perform it. And yeah, that's why we did the two readings at Ithaca College and they were really uh, successful and raised awareness. And finally, Ithaca College kids created a Dream Act group themselves and they got invited to Cornell. So I think uh, things are moving, you know, they can place like Dream Act. Similar uh, stories can be told in colleges, in universities, and of course, hopefully, in the professional theater, uh, as many stories like that should be there, I feel. I think there's a price for a dream, and, and the price is, you see it in the desert, you see it in the bodies that are found. Um, you see a price for a dream that um, 
in the families, like I said, that are being um, separated. And in Operation Streamline, have you guys heard of Operation Streamline? Mm. Everybody should know what it is. It is the uh, mass deportation, the federal mass deportations that happen daily. Um, well, the one I went to in Tucson, 70 to 100 people all being um, sentenced at once. They don't know what they're saying. They've got um, headsets on. They're being translated, and they're shackled. And um, their sentence, um, they come and they say, se culpable, I'm guilty. Um, and they don't even realize really what they're saying or why they're saying it, but it's like a script. It's a theater of humiliation for anybody who's in the courtroom, for the attorneys. It, 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 it was really shocking to see. Uh, last question, last question, can please. I, can I say one last thing? Yes, Sorry, sure. uh, uh, speaking to what was just being talked about, uh, there's a... <laughs> There's an element of idealism to it as well. Um, and there's a, an idealism, I think, that the young carry with them naturally. And there is, I took part in a panel last summer, um, and it, it was a similar thing. It was after Dream Acts, and there were a couple of dreamers there. And it was the first time in my life that I, uh, that I actually watched in person two kids. It was two kids, right, two testify. Um, and there is nothing more powerful than seeing such beautiful kids. They have this like inner light and this, and this belief that we as adults tend to forget. Um, and I think that as theater artists, uh, we retain some of that, you know, or a lot of it. And so, yeah, it's hope, uh, it's hope and so, I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> but I just wanted to put that forth. That's great. And indeed, like so many young people are now coming out as dreamers. That's an amazing sentence to come out. I'm a dreamer. Yes. Uh, last question, please. And then we sum up. If we don't have a last question, let's have final remarks from all our panelists. Thank yes. you. Uh, so, I'll, uh, so, the <laughs> so the reason why I think uh, this is most important, you know, there's the issue of immigration is huge, um, and it's a re it's a really really big picture, and it's not something that's going to get solved uh, immediately, uh, and and it's not just about the dreamers, you know, uh, there's uh, something has to be done for the other people as well. But the reason why the immediacy of this is because we've been raising generations of kids of quote unquote Americans who are disenfranchised and who, uh, th they're writing a very fine line. Um, and you're raising an entire level of society um, that could either have a positive impact for everybody, it's a collective thing, for everybody, or a negative impact. And so it's really important that we take care of the kids and that we let them know that they, that they matter and that they can, they can do something for their society, and for you, and for me, and for their country. Martin, a closing statement? Well, I'd like to just sort of pick up on what you just said, Saviana. Am I working again here? Okay, here we go. Um, which is that while it's marvelous that work like DreamX is, I published it, it's being done here and there, um, but the, the, the thing that needs to be fixed, um, and it relates to the immigration issue, but it relates to an, many, many other political and social issues, is that the large theaters in New York, certainly, are not a place where this discussion happens anymore. In the 40s, plays like All My Sons and you know, uh, Home of the Brave, After the War, uh, put were the central place where issues about who we were as a people were presented, and then, then they went to Hollywood, and then they, but the but stage was the focus for that discussion. I think Angels in America is probably the last time that there was a Broadway play that sort of managed for a while to capture enough attention to focus a discussion nationally on, on a topic. It was 20 years ago. And the theater industry, that's what it is, um, needs to be changed. Um, and I, that's my mission, but it's hard, and I, I, need, I need to hear how we do it, I don't know how to do it, but it's really, really important that, that these topics 
Um, I mean, rather than yet another movie star starring in a revival of yet another old play that even may be a great topical play like Death of a Salesman, but relates to an era 50 or 60 years ago, why aren't Saviana's plays and Jessica's plays and Carrie Dad's plays produced in the large regional theaters and Good in the question. nonprofit theaters and on Broadway? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Martin. Ma uh, Micah, last statement. Uh, thank you for having this panel. I think it's really, uh, and thank you all for having me. Thank you all, panelists. Uh, Caridad's idea. Yes, Caridad, <laughs> thank you. It really is important. Um, one of the things that struck me was I would tell people, even in Arizona, oh, I'm going to go speak on behalf of the Dreamers, of Dream Act. Oh, what's that? What's that, you know? Um, in the airport, I said, told somebody, oh, I'm speaking on Dreamers. What's that? You know, not everybody knows. And and yeah, we need to talk about it. And um, I'm going to quote Gloria Ann Saldua, change requires more than words on a page. It takes perseverance, creative ingenuity, and acts of love. So share the love. <laughs> Jessica, final statement. Oh, for God's sakes, we're in the theater. You know, stand up and do it. I don't care if it's not, you know, to me it's not an industry. I'm too old to worry about that. I'll, you know, I'm going to let my dear old friend who used to be a revolutionary, Oscar Eustace, worry about that. And I, um, and, and I, I, I don't care. Bring them on. I'm, I'm too old to worry about it. I do feel like, though, you here have to sit up and you have to do, if you're in the theater, you know, especially you young people that can still stand up, do it. And I come back, you know, my daughter, I'm sorry to keep bringing her up, but she's opening a play tonight and I'm here instead of there. And she's directing Marat Saad, which is not a new play, but it is the... Uh, uh, you know, it is a play with an old message, and it, the message of revolution, which is another word for dreamer. Um, and everyone in this room has the capacity to stand up, to breathe deep, and to act. And the, the, the song goes, how does it go? Marat, we're poor, and the poor stay poor. Marat, don't make us wait anymore. We want our rights, and we don't care how. We want our revolution. Now! <laughs> now, now. So yes, I think that this is discussion, of course, doesn't have a, a period, it has only a comma. And all I can say is the final line of our play, good luck, dreamers. Yeah. Thank you. So this is going to be a quick turnaround. We have a performance coming from uh, straight from London, uh, but what we need to do is uh, clear the space so they can set up. So if you would kindly, you can mingle in the lobby, you can do it in, but it's going to be a 10-minute turnaround, and then you'll have a performance from Sign Dance Collective International. Thank you. <laughs> 